It's a cold Sunday afternoon in Bristol. And dozens are queuing for free food from Anglican nuns. First in line are Blake and Sharon. Sharon's 19 and five months pregnant. She spent last night in hospital. Her midwife worried she wasn't eating enough for her and her baby. I haven't been eating properly and I've only been going to the soup run. Um, I had complications with my pregnancy, so I was in the hospital. And what would happen if you didn't have this place to come to? You'd starve. I think you'd crash and burn, really, to be honest. They live in a local hostel and are both on benefits, but they say they can't afford to buy food. What sort of debts do you guys have? Contract with a telephone provider and um, loan shark, basically, when you take money out from, like, online. You've got to pay them back. How much do you guys owe, do you think? I still owe round about, I think it's two grand. Anybody with a green ticket, please? The nuns say demand is rising. Many here have drug and alcohol problems. Most don't want us to show their faces. There you go, thank you. Can I have the next green ticket, please? We have a system where we don't ask any questions, but it, it's quite a demeaning thing to have to come and ask for food. On the whole, the people we meet here are not trying to play the system at all. They're people who really have got very, very difficult situations. Free clothes are on offer, so Sharon's picking out baby grows. That's so cute, it's just me. Yeah. Are you worried about bringing the wee baby into, into your world at the minute without any money? Slightly, yeah, but um, hopefully it'll get better in time. Um, you are, sir. Cheers, my lover. Today, in just 90 minutes, 228 people have got food. There we go, thank you. Bristol is one of the wealthiest cities in the country, but there are 50 places here where you can go and get free food. In fact, over the last three years, a dozen food banks have opened here. On the other side of Bristol, Steve Hudson sits in the dark to cut down on his bills. He's broke and not yet on benefits. How long has it been since you had your last hot dinner? Um, what are we on today? Wednesday, Thursday even. Um, it's about five days to last proper cooked, cooked meal. What are you surviving on? Um, well, the, 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 the last couple of days has, has, been, has, has, has been nothing, really. Um, other than that, since then, as you know, I've had some pieces of toast um, and some porridge, and that's, that's really been it. Steve, who's 27, used to dream of playing for Bristol Rovers. Can I see your French? Yeah. You just have uh, a couple of, uh, half a tin of uh, red kidney beans and a bit of a uh, bit of ketchup. Mm. That's all you have? Yeah, yeah. Steve's a recovering drug addict. He's had a chaotic lifestyle and fallen out with friends and family. There's always some kind of crisis in my life or other. And um, people ask, you know, how do you keep smiling? But you just, you just kind of crack on, you know, you just deal with it. He got a part-time job in a restaurant, but it hasn't worked out and now he's going back on benefits. He doesn't have the bus fare, so it's a four-mile walk to the job centre. And what will you eat tonight? At the moment, I don't know. Um, probably nothing. Nothing? Probably not. Do you have any toast in the house? No, no, I, I, used, I, I used the last of the bread earlier in the week. Steve knows he's partly to blame for his situation, but he's not the only one who says he's going hungry. 
In Bristol, food banks estimate they helped feed around 8,000 people last year. It's number 22. The East Bristol Food Bank is run in partnership with the Trussell Trust, a church-based network of food banks. Hello, I've got number five's food. Five years ago, the Trussell Trust had just 50 food banks. Today, it is more than 400. Here, people have to be referred to get free food. That may be a social worker who's working with a family that are struggling uh, to, to put food on the table. It may be someone referred by the job centre who's maybe lost work or changing their benefits. A lot of different agencies refer people for lots of different reasons. Yeah. Once they've been referred, people get enough food to last three days. The aim is to give people a balanced diet. So people are coming here for fruit juice, for tins of meat, for tins of, of tuna, for simple basic things, tins of rice pudding. We don't, we don't give out lobster thermidor. We give out basic food. It's impossible to say exactly how many people are being fed by food banks. But the Trussell Trust say they helped feed hundreds of thousands of people last year. And they say demand has tripled since 2012. The government says that the food banks are helping drive the demand by offering free food. Let me just quote some words back from somebody who runs a food bank. This is the Oxford Food Bank. Food banks do a good service, but they've been much in the news. People know they are free, they know about them, and they will ask social workers to refer them. It would be wrong to pretend the massive publicity has not also been a driver in their increased use. To suggest that people are simply walking through the door because it's a freebie and they can uh, take advantage of it is to suggest that more than 18,000 agencies in the United Kingdom are collectively colluding uh, because they're the ones that are signing the form saying please help this person they're in trouble. Eleven days ago a group of Anglican bishops published an open letter saying Britain faced a hunger crisis. They were accused of exaggerating the problem. I think they had a, a right obviously to speak out as a fellow Christian of course they need to speak out when they see concerns around uh, around uh, people in their parish and beyond that they feel are in need. Were they wrong? I, they were, I think they were wrong to do it in the way they did it because they're effectively being used, I, I felt, deliberately or not, as pawns in a wider political agenda. I don't think we're pawns of anybody's agenda. I mean, clearly any debate that's, that's about the affairs of the people of the country is going to have a political element. There's a, a lovely phrase from, due to Archbishop Desmond Tutu who says, there comes a point when you've fished enough people out of the river, you take a stroll upstream and see why they're falling in. And at that point, you're inevitably drawn into politics. Two weeks on, Steve's still got no work. He's had a small tax rebate, but most of that went to a loan shark and his first benefits payment is lower than he'd hoped, just £55 for the next two weeks. I suppose I feel kind of deflated, really, especially as I was kind of anticipating more. He's relying on free food again, as most of his benefits have already gone on debts, gas and electricity. Steve says he's left with £2.75 for the next fortnight. Thank you. Thanks. The staff in there are great, they don't judge you, they don't seem to have any kind of prejudgments on anybody. And if it wasn't for having the food bank there, you know, I, I'd, I'd, you know, dread to think what, what would be the case. It's 5 a.m. and the start of a busy day for yet another organisation running food banks in Bristol. It's called the Matthew Tree Project. Evangelical Christian Mark Goodway is delivering a new day's food supply. He's about to open his seventh food bank. He calls them food stores in Bristol. Does Bristol really need seven food stores in addition to all the other food banks and other places where you can get free food? Absolutely. It, you know, I've turned my life upside down to do this and I'm, I'm, I'm not of a mind to do that if there's no need to be met. His volunteers handed out 43 tonnes of food last year. But Mark doesn't just want to feed people, he wants to turn their lives around. People are expected to show their bank statements when they get free food. Is that not a bit intrusive? No, I, I, don't, I don't think it is intrusive because if some, somebody's coming to us because they're in financial hardship 
and they were like, and they're asking for our help to help them out of the financial problem they're in. We need to know what's going on. The recession has left many worse off than they were five years ago. A government commissioned report published recently dismissed the idea that people are taking advantage of free food. Its author says some people are simply broke. The reason that we have so many more food banks in the UK is because we have so many more people in need. Food prices have gone up about 30, 32%, depends on which food stuff you're talking about, over the last five or six years. And over that same period, wages have stayed the same or, or fallen. The government says a job is the best way out of poverty. And unemployment levels are now falling. But the latest figures dating back to 2012 show 9.8 million people in relative poverty. That's those living on less than 60% of the average income. In Derbyshire, they're taking radical action. The main public health concern used to be healthy eating, but now the County Council says there is a more pressing problem. It's now become an issue of food poverty in some people in the county not being able to eat at all. And if people can't eat at all, what's the point in trying to get them to eat healthily? Now, I'm responsible for promoting the health of the people of Derbyshire. And if people haven't got enough food to eat, I've got to do something about it. The council is investing £126,000 from its public health budget into food banks. Thank you very much. Gary, what's in this? Tell me what I'm eating. But not everyone thinks they're a good idea. Hello. Former Tory Junior Health Minister Edwina Curry lives in Derbyshire herself, so we've invited her to a food bank down the road. So let me just show you the food bank area. It was set up by Christian Thorpe, a pastor, whose church now feeds about 60 people a week. His food bank has been given £9,500 from the council's fund. Honestly, does it not worry you that this is the stuff you're giving them? Can I just say something to you? you know? If you have nothing, I mean, it... if you have nothing, if you have nothing at all, then a little bit of something is better than a lot of nothing. How are you going to get this message across that they have to live within their means, not get indebted, uh, plan for a rainy day, all the old-fashioned lessons yeah, that, yeah. that my generation yeah. learned. We're working with other agencies. We're trying to teach people to take responsibility and we take the opportunities to talk to them. And, of course, some people listen and then there's other people who don't listen. I think this is a, a bit of a trap. No, I disagree. For, for me, this is not a solution. I disagree. It's clear the visit hasn't changed her mind. I don't think there's a need for food banks. I think there's a need for a lot more support and help for people with problems. But do you accept there is food poverty then? No, I don't. I don't. I think people make choices. And what used to happen is putting food on the table was the first choice. And now for many people, it's not the first choice. And one of the reasons for that is they can get free food. Back in Bristol, some say it's not a question of choice. People are going hungry because they suddenly have no money. The biggest single driver for your food stores this last year has been what? The benefit changes. I mean, 23% of our clients, which is the biggest, biggest group, are here because their benefits have been stopped or reduced to such a level they can't survive. We've been told it's the same story across the country. Figures from food banks show that problems caused by benefits are the single biggest reason why people are getting free food. And that's confirmed by the Citizens Advice Bureau. But the government says that there's no robust evidence of a link between welfare reform and the rush for free food. The government says its benefit reforms will encourage the unemployed to get work. They're aimed at people like Ian Hoswell. After he missed meetings at his Bristol job centre, his job seekers allowance was cut completely for three months. He went from £71 a week to nothing. 
It's called being sanctioned. Guilty as charged. For whatever reason was, maybe I was ill, maybe I had the flu that day. I just do not, I cannot remember. But it seems such a drastic uh, punishment. If you are judged to have broken the rules, you automatically lose your job secrets allowance for at least a month. The toughest penalty, three years. The Department for Work and Pensions says the rules are made clear to claimants and people can apply for hardship payments and loans. Ian did apply and qualified for a hardship payment of £43 a week. But most people don't get the cash for a fortnight. Ian had to sell his CDs so he could eat. The lowest point was just eating a box of cornflakes dry and sitting in the dark, no electric. Spent three days like that. After his bills were paid, Ian's £43 hardship payment didn't go far. The fact he smokes didn't help. What would you say to these people? You would say, look, you had a choice there. You spent the money on cigarettes rather than food. I was under enough stress at the time from the government sanctions. Packing and smoking at that time <laughs> just had more stress onto me, which I just couldn't cope with at the time. With little money left, Ian's had to rely on the Matthew Tree project to eat. What did you enjoy from last time? Uh, usually the meatballs, which I have with pasta. A record number of benefit sanctions were imposed in the year to last September. A total of 875,000. So that means they've got either no money coming in at all, or virtually no money coming in, so it's impossible to survive on that. So, you know, you could have the debate as to whether they deserve the money or not, but don't starve them while you're doing that. You know, people should be treated with dignity, whatever their situation. There will be people who attend there who are in crisis, and yes, there will be some that have been part of the system of sanctions. And within that system is trying to ensure that local authorities are, are supported with um, hardship funds to be able to help people through that process. And we don't simply walk on the other side when that happens. In the latest government figures, we found a shocking statistic. In 11 months, more than 133,000 sanctions were overturned. That's almost 400 every day. But it can take weeks to challenge an unfair sanction and get the cash back. Now what that means, of course, is that people will have been left with little or no money for weeks until officials correct their mistakes. These are sanctioned sanctions which yes. should never have been given in yes. the first place. Dr. David Webster has been researching the government's figures on sanctions. That seems like an awful lot of people wrongly sanctioned. It is. It is a lot of people wrongly sanctioned. And it would be even higher um, if more people appealed. And of course the problem is that even if you get your sanction decision overturned, you still go through quite a lengthy period when you've got no income or, on your, or you're on a very heavily reduced income. Do sanctions push people into poverty? Basically, people who start poor are going to be driven into complete destitution. Suzanne Harkins and her husband found themselves on benefits for the first time when she lost her job and he became so ill he couldn't do his. Make us some nice for lunch. They were wrongly sanctioned after a clerical mix-up and their main benefit was cut to just £63 a week for a family of four. It was devastating. It got to a point that there was no food in the house and any food that did come in had to feed the two children and my husband and I would go for days at a time without eating. I was still breastfeeding Mason at the time and I stopped producing milk because I wasn't getting enough nourishment in to me to, to produce milk to breastfeed him. Suzanne was referred to a food bank. The sanction was overturned and the money refunded, but the family had been on reduced benefits for three months. I think the whole 
sanction policy as a way of the government saving money. And I, I, that probably does sound cynical, but that, that's how I not feel about, getting, about it. Not, not about getting people into work? No. No. So are sanctions about saving money? Take a look at this wall chart. It was displayed in a job centre in Grantham last year. It's highlighting to staff the savings that sanctions can bring. More than £900 with one three-month sanction. What the department say to, to our members is that uh, there isn't a target for the number of sanctions that you have to do each week or each month, but we expect you to do the same uh, as everybody else. So they set a figure that maybe the average in a certain cluster of offices, and um, that becomes what you're expected to achieve. Now that is a target. Uh, it might not be called a target, but to all intents and purposes it is. The government says the wall chart was an isolated local incident and does not reflect policy. It says there are no targets for benefit sanctions and they are used as a last resort. The vast majority of decisions are right and the appeals process is an important part of the safeguards put in place. But it's not just people on benefits who are struggling. Lisa Hall's landing home in a Bristol suburb after her shift at B&Q. She works 30 hours a week, but still went to a food bank. She says she has gone days without a proper meal. Your stomach rumbles, you feel sick, you get jealous. If you walk past a cafe or anything, it would be nice to have a certain type of food now that you haven't been able to afford for ages. Even sausages. I haven't eaten sausages for a while. Lisa takes home £900 a month, but after bills, including debts and running a car, she's left with less than a tenner a week. Her kids have left home. With two empty bedrooms, she no longer qualifies for the lower council rent, thanks to the so-called bedroom tax. So why not move and save money? I don't want to downsize. I brought my children up in this house. I've got it the way I want it. It's my stamp on it. I don't want to move away to another neighbourhood. I don't want to go somewhere else. She's gone and got herself a second job. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Delivering pizzas, sometimes working till four in the morning. Why are you doing this? To pay bills, so I can stay in my house. And so I can eat. She now works up to 60 hours a week and doesn't need the food bank. The government has said food banks are not part of the welfare system, but the line seems to be blurring. We found that many are now receiving support from the taxpayer. This is Chingford in North East London. It's where the government minister responsible for benefits changes, Ian Duncan Smith, has his seat. His constituency takes in two councils, and we've discovered that between them, they've committed almost £70,000 to help feed people. We've contacted every council in England and Wales. Just over a third of them, 140 councils, confirmed that they were subsidising food banks. £2.9 million pounds of public money has been committed to food poverty in the last couple of years. So are food banks becoming part of the welfare state? Whether it looks like we're becoming a substitute for the welfare state, they're valid concerns and they're the concerns that politicians and policymakers need to grapple with. Food banks are an inadequate plaster over a gaping wound. They do not solve the problems. And that they should be enshrined as an inadequate solution is deeply immoral. We wanted to ask the government about food banks on our research. We first asked the government for an interview three months ago, but nobody wants to talk to us about food banks. The Department for Work and Pensions referred us to the Cabinet Office. The Cabinet Office referred us back to the Department for Work and Pensions. 
before we were then shunted on to the Prime Minister's own press team at Downing Street. But despite all that, no interview. In a statement, the government told us that local authorities are now responsible for emergency help and had been given additional funding to pay for it. It also said that it is helping families with the cost of living and that all its welfare reforms will make three million households better off. We need government to, to be, you know, be explicit whether, whether food banks are to be part of the system. And if they are, then how do we make them work effectively? If they're not part of the system, again, we need a clear signal from government about that. Remember Steve in Bristol? He hasn't had to sign on for a while. OK, if you can end your pin. He's now working in a city centre bar. I'm less anxious, I'm less concerned about where my next income is coming from. Physically, um, obviously being able to eat a lot more now um, means that you know, I should hopefully put a bit of weight back on um, and feel a lot more fresher and, and a bit more invigorated, I suppose. And he's not the only one with good news. Lisa's been able to get full-time hours with B&Q. She no longer needs her second job. How important was it to have the food bank at that time? Very important. It was like a lifeline. It helped me get by. It laid food on the table. I was able to go for, and look for, for another job. I didn't feel hungry anymore. Many believe that food banks are here to stay. There's no doubt that they have helped many people, but the question remains, do we want a Britain where so many people are living on food handouts? <laughs>